Mollenhauer. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be reading uh, and talking and conversing about Klaus, Mollenha Klaus Mollenhauer's uh, Forgotten Connections, a book originally from the 80s, but translated by Norm Friesen uh, in 2014. And as a guest speaker, we're pleased to have Joris Fliege, uh, who since, and I'm reading from his profile, since 2018, Joris is an assistant professor of philosophy of education at the research unit Education, Culture and Society at KU Leuven in Belgium. Uh, before taking up the position in Leuven, he taught at other universities, British universities like Edinburgh, Liverpool and Aberdeen. And as a researcher, he is concerned with the impact of digitization on the future of schooling, the figure of the teacher, the meaning of educational practices and sustainability education. He has published, among other things, with Naomi Hudson and Piotr Samoyski, the Manifesto for a Post-Critical Pedagogy and Towards an Ontology of Teaching, Affirmation, Thing-Centeredness and Love for the World. And Joris uh, also published a review of Mollenhauer on the PESGB blog uh, and will be, we can also share that maybe in the chat if anyone wants to give it a look after that. Um, so Yoris will be introducing the, the reading for about 15 minutes and then we're free to talk and converse. So Yoris, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you Antonio for inviting me. Um, so I will shortly introduce the book by going over three points. I will first say something about a very good film that might help you to get at the heart of Mollenhauer's argument. Then I want to say something about the background, the specific German background against which we have to understand uh, this book. And then I want to say something uh, that is my third point about Mollenhauer's method. So um, when I teach uh, on Mollenhauer, I always start with the film, I don't know whether you know the film, uh, Children of Men. Um, it's not a particularly good movie, it's a Hollywood movie with a lot of violence, but um, the movie starts from a very interesting thought experiment, which is um, World, so it's a dystopian uh, science fiction film, which is set in a world in which the human species has become infertile. So people can no longer give birth. And so people start to die and there is no one left uh, to carry on with uh, our culture. What you see happening in the film is uh, that yeah, the world is no longer a meaningful place to live. Life has no meaning any longer. It's a very gloomy world where people only think about their own fate or their own sake. Um, There's a particularly interesting passage where someone um, has put Picasso's painting Guernica to the wall and it's just like wallpaper. It doesn't really have any meaning anymore. So what you can take from this movie is that um, education has a very um, deep existential and cultural meaning. So for Mollenhauer, education is not a teaching and learning. He's not concerned about uh, learning outcomes and making learning more efficient. Um, he's not concerned with individual learning. He's concerned with the relation between the generations. So um, the question which is central to the book is the very simple question, why do we want children? Well, the film shows it all. If there are no children, there is nothing to pass on to the next generation after our death. There is nothing left. So the whole point of education, the deeper sense and meaning of education, is that we want to pass on what we deem good in our life to people who come after us, the newcomers. So the idea is that we show to the new generation what we find important, and why we find it important in the hope that they continue with it, obviously in their own way as newcomers. This is an idea, by the way, that you can also find in the work of uh, Hannah Arendt. So um, it's very important to, to, to see that um, Mollenhauer gives a very deep 
philosophical meaning to what education is all about. Um, in the book, in the first two chapters, in the original German version, he consistently talks about Erziehung, which in German means that you take away children from the sphere of the home to bring them up in uh, school conditions. Um, and as from the third chapter, and he speaks about uh, Bildung, and Bildung is untranslatable, but it's a German word uh, that is about the formation of the full person in connection with uh, an existing culture. It's a kind of initiation in a uh, uh, shared culture. <clears throat> um, having said that, it's important to situate Mollenhauer within a particular German tradition. So up till the Second World War, the main school in Germany in philosophy education was the Geisteswissenschaftliche Pädagogik, so kind of Bildungspädagogy, if you want. Um, and if you would compare what Mollenhauer has to say in his book with this traditional pedagogy, there are not that many differences. Um, because the book that Mollenhauer writes is actually meant as a kind of return to this old traditional pedagogy. Because what has happened since then is the uh, Fourth Second World War and the uh, Holocaust, um, many philosophers like Adorno, pedagogues, like, uh, belonging to what is called the critical pedagogy, um, saw the traditional pedagogy as a cause of all the things that went wrong in the Second World War. So th the idea was that um, the initiation in the existing culture did not prevent uh, human beings uh, committing all these atrocities, and especially initiating people in the German culture, because until then, Germany was seen as, um, well, yeah, the country of the greatest philosophers, the greatest thinkers, poets, Goethe, uh, composers, Schumann and the like. So it was really seen as uh, a beacon of culture, and yet this has not prevented people from uh, committing extreme cruelties. So after the Second World War, you had this movement of the critical pedagogy, which comes down to uh, the idea that we do not have to initiate people in the existing culture, we have to emancipate people from an existing culture in order to set them uh, free. And this went hand in hand with quite anti-authoritarian movements. So um, it was truly believed that uh, uh, the existence of hierarchical relations between an elder generation telling the younger generation what is good in the world, yeah, that this was at the source of the things that happened in, uh, in Germany. And one of the big uh, defenders of critical pedagogy, and that might sound strange, was Klaus Mollenhauer. So in his earlier days, Klaus Mollenhauer was himself very devoted to uh, critical pedagogy, to try to show how culture might actually have uh, these um, uh, these uh, unwanted uh, effects. So we have to we have to become conscious of how people are suppressed by an existing uh, culture. So that was really his uh, educational program. So he wrote books on it, um, and uh, in which he also developed the method of dialogical education. So we uh, his uh, his. Um, Supervisor was Jürgen Habermas. So what he actually did was to translate the the, the concept of um, communicative rationality into a pedagogical method, which he called dialogical. One of the things is that he also 
actively aided uh, youth protest movements, movements which were actually terroristic in uh, the beginning of the 70s in Germany, Rot Armee Fraktion. And this is probably when he saw how many violence this, uh, to, to how many violence this led, that he came to the conclusion that uh, there was something horribly wrong about critical pedagogy, uh, meaning that we had to return to the basic insights of the more traditional uh, pedagogy, the Bildungspädagogik. Um, but in order to uh, and so I go to my third point. In order to make a convincing case, he cannot just uh, reheat the old cutlet, so to speak, and just repeat what has been said in this in this tradition. So, in another book that he wrote, like three or four years later, which is called Umwege um, Detours, um, he explains in detail what the method is that he uses in forgotten connections. Um, which is not directly addressing uh, pedagogical issues, but through detours. And um, so the people who have read the book will have seen that he makes enormous use of, at first sight, bizarre uh, examples, uh, very often taken from the existing, in his case, Western or German culture. So uh, he, may, he, may, he uses a lot of artworks, uh, he uses a lot of uh, stories in order to uh, make his argument, in order to convince uh, his readership um, about uh, what he thinks uh, should be said today. So there are certain things that should be said and remembered uh, today. And the best way to do that is by uh, carefully study uh, stories and uh, works of art, which he calls pedagogical objects. So, for instance, in the book Umwege, it's a very interesting study on uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, paintings, etchings, and so and so on on uh, anatomy classes and uh, how people gather around dead bodies, very famous painting. By, uh, by Rembrandt, which he uses to start talking about, um, about pedagogical issues or issues that pedagogically should matter to us today. So that were the three points that I wanted to raise as a kind of introduction. So, um, I suggest that we just go and start with our discussion. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joris, for that introduction. For sharing those three points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So as he as you already said, we're free to begin right now. So if there is anyone that feels like um sharing an insight, a reflection, could be a question, it could be uh, a part of the text that uh 